everybody. I think it's about time to get started. Um, I'm Isaac Della, second year master's student in forestry. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ursula Quillman. She was born and raised in a small town outside of Frankfurt, Germany, and has lived in Colorado since 1990. She earned a PhD in geological sciences at CSU Boulder in 2014. Today she will be talking about her teaching experiences during the semester of 2017, semester at sea. Her most recent studies have been in oceanography. Would you all please join me in welcoming Dr. Ursula Quillman. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you for uh, having me. Whoops, I should turn. That helps. Yeah. So thank you for introducing me. So I'm going to be talking about my 2017 spring voyage on semester at sea. And so I don't know if everybody is familiar with what semester at sea is. Semester at sea is a program that has a academic partner. And since the last two years, So since about two years ago, CSU has become the academic partner of Semester at Sea. And what I heard from the folks at Semester at Sea is that they really feel at home here at Colorado State because they were welcomed in with open arms. So Semester at Sea is a floating campus. All the classes that are being offered on Semester at Sea are CSU classes. So if students take, no matter where they come from, if they take classes, they get the CSU credit. It's a platform for global education. We have a chance to incorporate a lot of experimental learning. There are field classes, there are in-country programs, and the coursework is also global towards the ports we are visiting. So the voyage, I was honored. Dan and Jane. We started out in San Diego. We had a quick refuel shop, a stop in Hawaii. We went to Japan, China, Vietnam, Myanmar, India. We skipped Mauritius. We went to South Africa, Ghana, Morocco, and then to Germany. So when I first started teaching, oceanography at CSU had a lot of friends snickering, you know, don't you know you're in the middle of the country and oceanography. And I told them, just wait, CSU is going to get me a ship. Yes, and four <laughs> years later, semester at sea came around the corner and got me a beautiful cruise ship. And they actually took me back home to Germany. So I think it was really a win-win situation. So just a little bit of context. So usually we have about 570 students on board. I don't know what happened to the spring semester. They packed us and we had over 600 students, 50 faculty. So semester at sea, faculty, staff is not separated, but we're one unit. A lot of the faculty traveled with families. So the youngest one was two years old, and then there were also lifelong learners, and the oldest one was 87. About 10% were international students, and then about 170 officers and crew. The semester at sea voyages are usually around 105 days, with about 55 days at sea and 50 days ashore. When we're on the ship, there are A and B days. And so I taught two classes on an A day, one class on a B day. There are no weekends, so we just teach every day. And the stretch from Hawaii to Japan was pretty intense because we had, I think, 12 days straight teaching and we had high waves. So that was a pretty interesting scenario. Uh, we visit between eight and 10 ports and in each port we have on the average about four or five days. 
So two ports were only one day, but then there was a couple where we had six days. We offer about 70 to 75 course sections, and the class sizes are usually around up to 30 students. There are field classes, field programs, independent travel. So for each class that we teach, we have to take our students on a, on a field class and we have to spend about eight hours with the students in the field and I'm going to be talking about my field classes in a moment. Field programs are organized by semester at sea and we actually had a full time a field program director on board and she helped arrange all these travels. And we can travel independently. The rule is if you travel independently and you're not back on time for ship time, you either get dock time in the next port or the ship even takes off without you. Then we had evening seminars. We have programs, so student life programs. The students organized a lot of clubs while on sea. So we had a sustainability club and I think everything from board, from games to, do you remember what we all had? It was many, many different. We had health. Yeah. Yeah. Health and births, yeah. And one nice thing were the, what I really liked were the interport lecture and interport students. So, for example, in China, we picked up a professor from Vietnam and a student from Vietnam. And so they sailed with us from China to Vietnam and they helped us to prepare for the country. Then in Vietnam, we got somebody joining us from Myanmar and so it went around the globe. It was really helpful to have somebody from the country with us. Yeah, and then I never lived in a dorm, so that was the ultimate dorm experience, you know, to be with the same people for four months, almost four months. Yep, it was, I really enjoyed it. And the food was a little bit like dorm food. In the beginning it was really good, but then after a while I was really looking forward to my husband's cooking. So the stackily, so the, it is one teaching, learning team. And we all just pool our expertise and, and go with the flow. So we integrated all the academic and the student affairs. And so we were addressing by teaching the whole student. And the principle of the CSU community were emphasized on the ship. And then we really talked a lot about environmental education. So here's just a picture of the faculty on board. <clears throat> so what I'm going to be talking about is, so before I went on the ship, we had to be prepared, because there's no internet or the internet is super slow on the ship, so everything has to be up front. It's almost like teaching a, an online class where you have everything in place by the time the semester starts. And so we had lectures, readings, documentary, and I had everything prepared. And then on the ship, we had a lot of discussions. And the emphasis was always to get away from the single story, to open up everyone's minds, including ours. And one thing that we learned right in the beginning is you had to be really flexible because you had things planned and then it just didn't work the way it was planned and you had to make adjustments. So in my classes, I emphasize to share experiences and observations. So I, had, so I put my students into groups and I, they had all different days where they had to observe the ocean and report what is the weather like and what they saw, whether we saw ships and so everything they thought was important. We were in the middle of the Pacific and I was reading these reports and then 
students were reporting these dragonflies. There were dragonflies in the middle of the Pacific, but they were animate. These are dragonflies. And then one day I saw a dragonfly and it was actually flying fish. But if you're standing on the eighth deck and you're looking down, they, they kind of look a little bit by dragonflies. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then also in the ports I give students, I also divided them up in groups and they just came back and reported back what they saw in the country that's related in some ways to oceanography. Uh, they did a final report on that. One thing that I learned and that I'm into incorporating now in my lecture classes are these reflection sessions. After each port we got together in small groups with our students and we talked about the port experience. And I realized even though I teach big classes here with 350 students, I realized these students probably never have time to reflect on what they learned. And so I, so now every three weeks they do a reflection question. And then, but luckily I have a TA who helps with the grading. And then in my oceanography class, I did an in-class debriefing after, after each port. And I'm going to be talking about the water sampling and the drifters I did on board. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the field classes that I had in my class. So first of all, I want to point out, so this is a map, I think it was published in National Geographic. It shows in this circle, there are more people living in this circle than all, anywhere else all together. And we spend most of our time in this very, very crowded part in the world. <coughs> so. So I organized my slides a little bit with ecological problems. One of the problems that I have become really interested in over the past few years is, is sand mining. We're taking so much sand from the beaches, from the ocean, from the coastlines, that we're actually running out of sand. And there is a sand mafia going on in India and in other parts of the world. For a lot of the construction, you cannot use sand from the desert because that sand is well rounded and sand from the beaches is more angular. And when you make concrete, you want this more angular uh, sand. And so I was ready to observe sand mining and I was shocked all the things that we, that we saw. So this was in Shanghai and we had a really, I think that was the nicest port with the best views, it was just really beautiful. So I have a friend who lives in Shanghai and he took me on an ex excursion. And Shanghai has built this deep sea port outside of Shanghai just to have enough space for all the big container ships to come in. So here's a satellite picture of this area from 1984 and you see this archipelago of islands. And now there's this big artificial island that was built on top of all these all these little islands and it's a big deep sea port and I was really quite amazed when I saw these, these pictures. And it was a quiet day because we were there during the Chinese New Year. And the first thing that came to my mind is, you know, where does all this building material come from? And I saw that, I mean, everywhere we looked there was sand piled up and the sand had different colors. And so part of the island, they were just, the sand was just, or the sediments were just mined off the mountains. And, oh yeah, 
Like I said, we were there during Chinese New Year. So when we arrived, so all the manufacturing places were closed and, and the air was beautiful, blue sky, even people who went up to Beijing, they had beautiful blue skies. The Chinese New Year was over and then the next day, you know, everybody was manufacturing again and the air pollution was bad. <coughs> So the nice thing was that students traveled all over China and then we got together and we talked about our experience and so so what people reported back from China was as you were leaving Shanghai there were miles and miles of skyscrapers of future apartment buildings or they were built but they were all vacant and still that building went on and on and so there was one where the sand goes to a lot of the area in around Shanghai had massive sea walls because of sea level rise, so protecting the coastlines. Students saw a lot of air pollution, plastic pollution. And it was overcrowded. And spoiler alert, we saw sand mining pretty much in every port we went. So I went with my students on four field classes. So one was in Hawaii, the other in Vietnam, South Africa, and in Ghana. So in Hawaii we went snorkeling and we checked out a, a coral reef. So this is a bay in Hawaii and it's now protected. They only allow about 2,000 visitors in per day and you have to watch a 15 minute video where you get informed what to do while you're on the reef. But nevertheless, people were just trampling over the corals. There was a dad, he ripped off a piece of coral to show his kid and, and there were these little plastic debris washed up all along the shoreline. So plastic in the ocean is also a big problem. But we have plastic on land that is even that's biodegradable if you put it in a landmine the landmine the, yeah these the landfills I mean the landfills get so hot and there are bacteria in there and they can break down the plastic but plastic in the ocean never goes away it just turns into smaller and smaller and smaller fragments and become microplastic so we now think that on the average there's about 8 to 1 ratio between microplastics and plankton in the Pacific Ocean. So it is, it is something that is very, very scary. And so what we observed on that trip was plastic pollution. So my students came back from snorkeling and they had plastic bags, whatever they found in the reef, they, we carried out. We saw visitors stressing the corals even more. We saw a lot of coral bleaching and the bio biodiversity on the reef was very low that we did not see very, very much. And the inner reef was trampled, but when you went further out, the corals looked a little bit, little bit back, be, better. I think one of my favorite field trips was the field trip in Vietnam, we went to this biosphere reserve. And Dan was here today, he took his class there as well. So with Mark Paschke from the, here from the department, I got in touch with this person in Vietnam who gave us a tour. And it turned actually out that Dr. Tuan was the director of this bio reserve. So on our way in, so this was Saigon where we started, where we took off to the to the reserve. We saw sand mining along the shore. We saw barge after barge after barge of sand being carried out. And when I ask, so most of the sand goes to China or goes to Singapore. 
the Mekong Delta, you still have a lot of traditional fishing going on. We noticed a lot of bank erosion, invasive species, and people, I mean, they live on the Mekong, that's their lifeline. So what, from, what came for me totally unexpected was, so on the ship we had all these seminars, we had global studies, and so we learned a lot about the Vietnam War, and a little did I know that we would run into the Vietnam War on my field class. So the pictures don't disappear, it's nice and clean, and this one is not. So during the Vietnam War, a lot of Agent Orange was sprayed, and it just, it killed people, but it also killed an entire, entire ecosystem. So you can see it a little bit better here, though this was the forest before, and then after the Vietnam War, the mangrove forest was totally, totally wiped out. And mangroves, they are really, they're really important. <coughs> They, they are a green wall, so they protect from hurricanes and from storms. They're green lungs, they, they provide clean air, and they're green kidney, they filter out the rivers. So they, they trap, so mangroves have these root system where they trap all the sediments, so they're really stabilizing the coastlines. And Dr. Tung, he started replanting mangroves about 40 years ago. And today, it's, it's this thriving mangrove forest. It was really amazing to see that these trees are so resilient that they come back despite the, the soil being poisoned. Even the ecosystem came back, so there were monkeys and crocodiles and mud skippers. So I took my students and we, we planted mangroves. So students got nice and muddy, but they all had a, had a good time. So this was actually one of these field classes where you have sort of a positive outcome. So sometimes when I teach, I always feel like I'm teaching just sad things, negative things. And there, there was really a lesson of hope and there is resilience in nature. And then of course we had very muddy students. And so the students, what they shared with me after Vietnam, so we had different students going to different places. They all noticed pollution, and that it was really, really crowded, invasive species, and then, so my students knew I was interested in sand mining, and I got so many pictures back of ships <laughs> with sand. <laughs> so after Vietnam, we went to Myanmar. Yeah, so, so these field programs at Semester at Sea offer, they're not just sightseeing, but many have a service component in them. And so this one had a service component. We visited a monastery, and we got to talk to the little monks and to little nuns, and we brought them paper and pens. It was something they had requested, because Semester at Sea had asked them what can we bring that would help. But, and so we did. And then we went, so I flew up to Bagan into the archaeological site. And so part of the money from our trip was used to drill a, a well for this little village. And so we had, they had this big celebration for us and they, it was really quite touching. So I love to take photos. And I got all these really wonderful pictures of Bagan with that, with that mist. It's just really beautiful sunrises, sunsets. But the sad truth was, they 
people were burning their trash on plastic. That's where that haze came from. It looked great in pictures, but it's not. It had a sad story behind it. And, and so I got in this conversation with some students. They were really upset that people were burning their trash next to their houses. And, but I told them, you know, we are lucky. So if you'll, so I put my trash in a garbage can, and every Wednesday somebody picks up my trash, and I never see it again. <clears throat> but what do you do if you live in a country where nobody picks up your trash? So you have to do something. You might burn it, and you end up with the air like this. Again, I got many, many pictures of sand mining on the Irrawaddy River pollution and overcrowding. So here's a picture of one of our post-port reflection groups. So usually the global study, we had everybody, students, and faculty, faculty, lifelong learners, the kids, we were all together in this, in this big lecture hall. Or, but then in the reflection groups, we all we broke down and each of us had about 10 to 20 students for these reflection groups. And I thought they were really important because people came back and they had so many things that they needed to process. And it was also interesting to see that people had different experiences and so by just having the chance to talk about them really helped to get the bigger picture and get different perspectives. In India, I did some independent travel. So we, our, our arrival was announced in, the, in their daily newspaper. So we were in Southwest India. And I, I call that India 101. It was I think it was a much more laid back experience. A lot of the students and faculty went to other parts of India that were much more difficult to deal with if you're not prepared. But I was pleasantly surprised when I saw these sculptures, they call it the, the fish cemetery in Fort Kochi where people had taken all the trash that they found in the ocean and made these sculptures. And I put this picture in, this is my daughter. My daughter and husband came and visited me in India, so we stayed for, we traveled together for six days. In, in Fort Kochi, there are still these um, traditional Chinese fishing nets. In the 1400s, Chinese fleets came to India. And so the story is that these nets actually date back they lower these nets into the water and then the fish swim over them and then after a while the fish is being pulled up and then the fish being picked out. I just had to do some pictures of the monkeys I photographed. Yeah, and people were living along the water, so this was their yeah, lifeline. <coughs> And what students shared with me was huge pollution, overcrowded. And again, I heard a lot of stories about sand mining. <clears throat> we crossed the equator, and so we got hazed with green slime poured over us. And some people got their heads shaved, and, and you had to kiss a fish and then Neptune granted his passage into his yeah, yeah, into his empire and wished you safe travel. I have the movie at the end. So while I was on the ship, we also deployed drifters from NOAA, so it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we had asked for a couple of drifters. Drifters are these buoys that we throw overboard and they record salinity, temperature, air pressure, air temperature, and they drift with the ocean currents. 
And so these data get uploaded to a satellite and then scientists can use these data to follow ocean currents. And so, so we didn't hear back from NOAA and we thought, oh, it's not going to happen. And then middle of December, there was just about two weeks before we went to San Diego, <coughs> we got an email that NOAA had deployed a pallet full of drifters. So we ended up with 31, 31 drifters. So these, this drifter program started in 1979, but then in 1988 it has become a really big program. So each of the drifters has an ID, and the drifters have a battery in them, and so they last for about two years or so on, on the ocean, and then they die. So these are surface floats. They have a battery pack. They have a transmitter, so they can measure sea surface temperature, salinity, barometric pressure, wind speed, and wind direction. On the drifter, you have a, a sea anchor. And that sea anchor is this material out of net, and it's about 15 meters long. And we call it also a sea anchor because that net goes down into the current and anchors the drifter into the current. Otherwise, the wind would just blow it around. But this way, it's anchored into, yeah, into the ocean water, into the current. Yeah, and hopefully minimizes the effect of wind and waves on, on the currents. And so the drifter floats, so here you can see the, the anchor quite nicely, and then it, trim it transmit the data. And so we were asked to deploy all the drifters in the southern hemisphere. So NOAA usually asks for volunteers to deploy these drifters. And so we sent them our voyage and they decided that they really needed more data in the, in the southern hemisphere. Because right now, there's a lot of change going on. So here in the equatorial Pacific is where the El Nido La Nina pattern happens. And that pattern seems to be changing because of global climate change. And if the La Nina El Nino pattern changes, it influences the ocean currents. <coughs> yeah. So right now, where am I here? Here's, yeah, Africa is here on the, on the corner. <coughs> so you have a warm current coming in from the Indian Ocean. And you have a cold current coming up on the other side from Antarctica that has a lot of upwelling. This is a very nutrient-rich current, and this is a very nutrient-poor current. And it seems like that this current is becoming weaker over time. And so if it brings less, if it brings less nutrients to the surface, it has big implications for, for the ecosystems. So we deployed drifters in the, in the Indian Ocean. And then in the Gulf of Guinea after leaving Cape Town in South Africa. So we had 31 drifters that, that we deployed. So I mentioned earlier that we skipped Mauritius. There was something weird going on with the with some payments that weren't made and, and had we gone to Mauritius, our ship would have been impounded and so we didn't want to risk it. So instead of going to Mauritius, we had a snow day because after all, semester at sea is, is part of CSU. So we had a late start and we had activities all day. And I was supposed to take one of my oceanography classes on a field trip in Mauritius, and then next time we met, they were all upset, and they said, okay, let's just have the class in the pool. And nobody objected, so we, we had class in the pool. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So here are the drifters. That's what they 
they look like. The captain and the, and the officer on the ship, they helped us to tell us the time and to deploy because we had to deploy like one south, two south, two degrees south, and they told us when it was time. Sometimes it was two in the morning, sometimes it was 10 in the morning. So yes, for one time, Stack and we were sitting together in, there was one bar that was just for Stackley after 5 p.m. and I had to deploy a drifter at 10 o'clock and I said, who wants to go? And everybody in the bar came with me and we deployed a drifter. Then we had students getting involved. This was one of my students, Dimitri, he was really happy. It was his birthday and he got to sign the drifter and tossed it. And then also lifelong learners got, got involved. Yeah, so here I have a better map that shows the warm Agulas current and the colder Benguela current. <clears throat> then I also did a lot of water sampling. That guy that you see, the pirate, we were sailing through the Straits of Malacca and there's still a lot of piracy going on. And apparently by putting a fake pirate on board tells the pirates that we are watching out for pirates. And we had crew walking on the top deck with fire hoses. So if pirates would start climbing up, they would have been hosed off. Yeah, so I had, a, I had a plankton net with me, so we took water samples out of each ocean basin. So I think at the end I had about 23 water samples, and then my students analyzed them. We had a, we had a microscope on board, and we got to look at the samples. Well, we found some foraminifera and other little plankton pieces. <clears throat> but in every single sample that we looked at, we found microplastics. It was really quite sad. <clears throat> we got to South Africa, and Desmond Tutu has a long relationship with Semester at Sea, and so he came on board the afternoon. I just saw him briefly when he was leaving because I was on my second, on my third field trip. Because I couldn't do the field trip in Mauritius, we had to improvise. So I took my students to a penguin colony in South Africa. And for these guys, it is so important that they have this cold, nutrient-rich water from the Benguela current. And it was so warm. These guys were really suffering. So, so would you when you see a penguin colony, penguins are, they talk, they are noisy, and they were not, they were pretty quiet. So a lot of the chicks, they were molting, so they, so they get born in their, in their baby fur, and then they toss it, and then out comes this beautiful, sleek penguin. They were just hot and sweating. And you can see that a lot of the the baby chicks, they were flat on the ground. I mean, they were still moving, but I hope they made it. It is a, it's one of the few penguin colonies that are on land, and there are some naturalists keeping an eye on, on the penguin and also making sure that tourists don't get, get too close to them. They try not to interfere and let nature take its course, but it was so, so hot. And when, they, and when penguins are molting, they cannot get, go into the water. And, and the moms and the dads, they had to swim out really far to find any food, and so everybody was exhausted. And so they walked around with spray bottles and they cooled off the penguins because it was unseasonably hot. Let me just see. So I have a... I have a little video of one of the little guys. <clears throat> I 
I can, I don't know if you can see it, but they, they swim like ducks and then they dive. When they see food, they dive. And there are other penguins that are hunting while under, underwater. Yeah, these were those little penguins. Yeah, that's the same guy. Yeah, then in South Africa, there's a lot of activities <coughs> that bring up your adrenaline. And so we had a lot of students that went shark cage diving. So I asked my students, please don't go, because I, <coughs> I don't like the idea too much and a lot of the outfitters so this is shark alley in south africa a lot of great whites and these outfitters they chum the water so they put food in the water to attract the sharks so in my opinion the sharks are going to be associating food with people they might even become more aggressive and and dangerous and you cannot really see it on this picture but this shark was pleading all over because they run into these cages, so I, I was not, not happy about that. <coughs> so students shared their shark cave diving pictures and many of them said we're never going to do that again. It was cruel towards the animals. Students felt really sad for the penguins because they were really suffering. And South Africa last year was in a big trout, and this year's even even worse. And the changes in the in the pattern of precipitation also have to do because the ocean currents are are changing. So it's all part of that global climate change. On our way back to the northern hemisphere, we crossed the equator again. And we crossed the equator at the zero at the zero meridian, so zero zero. So that makes us emerald shellbacks. So if you cross the equator on the ship, you become a shellback. But on the zero zero, that's not very many people who are doing it. So I don't know if you know Patrick Donovan. I have this little video of him. We don't have, he was just saying that it was really cool to cross it <laughs> at zero, zero. Next stop was Ghana. Ghana for me was really fascinating, but it was also the hardest country to see. Just for me, just all the garbage and all that plastic pollution on the beaches got to me. There was a layer on the beach about that thick, just plastic and flip-flops. And so by training, I'm a geologist. And so for me, it was for the first time that I realized we humans have created a new geological layer. And I don't know if that can ever be cleaned up again. Oh, here's a picture. So there was just garbage everywhere yeah, and there were pigs and dogs and cows and it was just it was just in, incredible um, <coughs> so when the so and so when the fishermen come back uh, the women they clean the fish and they smoke the fish again you can see all that garbage so we met with the, the village chief. So he is the guy here in the, in the white outfit. And he, so he talked to us about the changes that they have witnessed over the last few decades. They had to change the mesh sizes on their nets because there are no more big fish, it's all smaller fish. And he said it's because there's a lot of big, big commercial trawlers that fish off the coast of Ghana, and they take out all the, all the big fish. So in, 
In the tradition in Ghana, every Tuesday belongs to the sea gods and you don't go out and fish. And fishermen stay home and they mend their nets. And every year there's one month where they don't go out to the ocean, they call it the rebirthing of the fish. But now, of course, it's no longer the place and they are suffering quite a bit. So that was kind of, for me, that was really the, the toughest country just to see that. And it was also a point where you can really feel hopeless, hopeless, because how can you clean up so much plastic. So I would love to go back to Ghana and clean up this, this beach. So maybe it's something that I will do one of these days. And students, we, we traveled around, students came back. It was an overwhelming pollution problem. Overcrowded and so many children. The median age in Ghana is a little bit over 20 years, so it's just so many kids. Being on the ship sometimes is dangerous. We had a fire on board right after, I forgot, was it after or before Ghana? Yeah. It's not supposed to have that black smoke That's right, thank you. Yeah, so the captain comes on board and says, okay, this is not a trail or personnel to the, to the engine room. And so there was a generator that was on fire. Luckily, the weather was warm. The water, we were in the, in the equatorial low pressure system, so the, the ocean was totally flat. If we had to evacuate the boat, it would have been probably the best place <laughs> to do so. It was. So all the stabilizers were turned, I mean, it turns the engine off and then also the stabilizers don't work anymore. But because the water was calm anyways, the ship was pretty calm. It took a few hours till they had repaired it and, and the captain turned on the engine again. And then it takes about three hours till the engine is warm enough to, to start sailing again. So that was our little adventure on board. <laughs> there were a lot of rams on the ship. So this, uh, this is us. So there were quite a few students and faculty, staculty, and you might recognize some. <clears throat> One of the students made this. Hmm? I didn't recognize myself. Oh yeah, you're still bald, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna show you that movie in a sec. S students get creative and they made this beautiful picture. And I'm gonna skip two pictures ahead because at the equator crossing, we had the option of having our heads shaved. And Dan did so and Jane didn't know about it. Jane was the ship doctor on board and his wife. <laughs> she hadn't seen the hair yet, or the lack of the hair. So, how are we in time? Good? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. I think I got probably the microphone totally lost. Any questions? Yeah? I wonder about the bio, uh, the uh, biodegradability of the drifters. 
So they, they function for two years. And then they, and stay. they all stay. They forever. stay in the ocean. Some of them might wash up. Is the, are the nets the... Uh, yeah, they're probably ghost anger. nets at the end. It's probably not a good thing for the environment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to weigh what are we learning and what are we destroying. Yeah, we, so if I talked to some students about it and some had the idea, maybe they can have rechargeable batteries and these drifters would last much, much longer. So, <laughs> yeah? Is there a reason they're not solar powered? It seems it's probably just a matter of maybe cost and because they've been around for so long, they probably haven't updated the technology, so they had batteries in them. There was a, a buoy at zero zero. Yeah. That, um, would write itself <coughs> uh, with satellite meetings and go back to zero zero. And it had a solar battery. Yeah. But uh, it's so Yeah. It's called the Null Island, and I think that a lot of GPS systems, they orient themselves at the buoy at zero, zero. And it's a weather station as well, and I think it's, it's NOAA is in charge of it, if I remember correctly. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, I'm just curious what some SRC's practices are for doing with the gray water. Well, Dan, you actually had a tour behind the scenes on the ship. So. It goes out into the ocean. If you're out at sea, if you're in the port, then you have to store it and then dump it in the ocean, or sometimes on land in the sewage facilities. But there are tight regulations if you're near the coast, but if you're out in the mm -hmm. ocean, not so much. Mm -hmm. it's a little. Yes, they do have good treatment on board that. So the gray water, by the time it goes out, is is safe water. Um, it's just got some nutrients and other things left, but it's not bacteriological. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they also had requirements about what fuel they could burn. If they're out at sea, they could do really low quality diesel that produced air pollution. But if they're coming into port, they had to burn more expensive gasoline to make less, not mm -hmm. gasoline, more expensive fuel to make less air pollution. Yeah. <coughs> I was just curious, like, what's being done to address the microplastics issue? Like, oh, that is, is there, such... Are there people on the <coughs> forefront of that trying to clean that up, or is that really just like... There is, there is so much going on, and it, it starts on land, you know, that, that in a lot of cities, you don't have straws anymore, because straws in the ocean is, the, is a huge problem. Plastic bags that you get at a grocery store, when they float in water, they look like jellyfish. You know, if you imagine an upside down plastic bag with a handle, it looks like a jellyfish. And that's a favorite meal of a lot of other fish and of turtles, and so they eat them. So I think that we have to do something on land and then also cleaning up the ocean, but getting all that microplastic out is pretty much impossible because then you would have to remove all the all the plankton. And the thing is, it just ends up in our systems again because it gets eaten by little fish, by bigger fish, and we are one of the top consumers. So it ends up in our bodies. It, it tends to float though, right? It's not. It tends. No, it's usually it's floating in the upper, in the upper water column. And let me just go back to this, this one slide. Yeah. This one here. <coughs> so if you dump plastic in the ocean, it usually gets carried around by the ocean currents. And in each of the, these ocean currents, we have a, a gyre, which is the circular current system. So we have one in the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, South Pacific, North Pacific, and one in the in the Indian Ocean. So if you have, let's say, if you have plastic here in the North Atlantic, so because of Coriolis, the currents are going to the right, they're going clockwise. And so by Coriolis, that plastic 
is trying, it's getting pushed towards the center of the gyres. And the gender or center of the gyres are wind still and they're calm. So whatever gets trapped in the gyres stays in the gyres. And that's why all the plastic accumulates in the center. And the first gyre that was discovered, the first plastic gyre was in the North Pacific. And, but I've, since then scientists have gone out and there are these plastic accumulation in each of these gyres. So it's really, I wish there was a solution, but it's a big, big job. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I would say it's probably one of the most pressing problems. I don't know if you followed the news, but last week there was a sperm whale that washed up at the Mediterranean coast, and I don't know how many pounds of plastic that whale had in its baleen. And that whale was starved to death because the stomach is full with plastic and there's no room for food. A lot of seabirds die because of the same thing, that the stomachs are full and they cannot eat. It just seems like such a massive issue that touches on so much that it, it, it's almost upsetting to just throw our hands up and say, like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> But we shouldn't. I mean, I just, I think everything that we can do helps. I mean, there's, there's things in progress to take the big plastic pieces out of the ocean. And that would help. And for me, so the, for me, so the totally ironic thing is that it's marine plankton who, over the eon, geological time, turned into oil. And now we're taking this oil out and we're making these plastic products and oil, and it's so cheap. And then it gets back into the ocean where it, and back into the plankton. It's just like a, like a weird cycle of life. <laughs> yeah, I saw another hand. Yeah. Oh, I went to India a few years ago, and it's kind of like that with like, the plastic and the trash everywhere. Uh -huh. The state of it is like insane. But the really? prime minister is working on the recycling program. Uh -huh. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Anything helps. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. Questions? I just think Dr. Richard told me one more time. Thank you. It's my pleasure.